I was just in D.C. a couple of months ago, well, in fact, it was January, uh, because we went, uh, my daughter and I went out there in January, beginning of January, so that uh, she just graduated from UNLV and political science. So we went to D.C., and then we went over to New Jersey for uh, her fiancé, soon-to-be, next day, husband, uh, and uh, who is graduating from the Coast Guard uh, boot camp there. And so for, for, I think most everybody knows that we have become, in the last few months, uh, in, so in June, my son, Josiah, went off to Coast Guard boot camp. And so in the last few months, we have become, uh, dare I say, a Coast Guard family. And the reason why I say that is because, if you know me, I'm a United States Marine. And uh, so, uh, and yes, once a Marine, always a Marine. So... That's why. Uh, and so we, we have this, this thing, though, in this, uh, you know, learning about the Coast Guard and everything. Well, the motto of the United States Coast Guard is Semper Paratus. I don't know if you've heard that. I know what Semper Fidelis is. That's the Marine Corps motto of always faithful. And, uh, man, that's a good one to live by. Semper Fidelis, always faithful. So when I saw the Coast Guards of Semper Paratus, I'm like, always, always what? Uh, So I discovered, always ready, always prepared. They're always ready. And I'm like, man, that is a great motto. Wouldn't that be good if maybe Christians were to adopt that as a motto, one of our mottos of Semper Paratus, always ready, always ready to make Christ known always ready to live out our faith, always ready to, to love him and grow in him and walk in him, always ready to make him known. I'm like, man, that, I would like that. It, it runs in line, doesn't it, of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Take a look at it. It's on the screen there. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. So first of all, Christ is to be first in your life. And then always... Oh, here it is. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. You see, Christians live by hope. We have a hope in Christ and what Christ has accomplished. And my hope is that I'm not home yet. This is just a temporary location. I will be home with Jesus. But in the meantime, I'm here and I'm ready to make a defense for that. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. I know we if you've been around church world, we know about this verse a lot. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for you for the reason for the hope that you live in you. And we tend to forget the last little bit there of, and yet do it with gentleness and respect. Like, oh, that's probably a really good thing to add in when we're thinking about making Christ known. But semper paratus, always ready. I want us to be always ready to make Christ known. And so this morning, when we are learning about making a defense for the gospel and always being ready to tell of God's goodness, to be able to tell of God's mercy, to be able to talk about his love and and his transforming power to change our lives, when we get the opportunity to be able to talk about that with others, I I wondered if if you're able to do that, if you're ready. Can you do that? Would you be able to tell me in just a couple of words what the gospel is? It's interesting when you ask a lot of Christians, hey, what is the gospel? You're going to get a whole slew of ideas about what the gospel is. Can you explain it? Can you explain it in just a couple of words? Do you know your own story? Is, Is God been transforming your life? Do you know Christ? And is he continuing to change you so you have something to be able to tell and share? Well, this morning in our study of the book of Acts, We get to unfold this passage of the Apostle Paul. We've been going through this book and reading through this study. We're going to finish it in two weeks. But in this particular place, in uh, chapters 21 through chapters 26, we, we see that Paul is making a defense for the gospel. We're going to see that he's able to communicate the the great goodness of God, the love of God, the resurrection of Christ, and and what is it that's all 
how do you tell your story? How do you share Christ? How important it is that we know the gospel. How, how that, we, that we've experienced ourselves the transforming power of the Spirit of God. And that we're ready to make a defense for the hope that is in us. Well, we're going to see that all out of Acts uh, chapter 21. And we're, it's really the, the second half of Acts 21 that we're going to be looking at this morning. And, and obviously we, we can't read five and a half chapters of oftentimes we'll, if you're new here, we'll read the section so we have context. And uh, I'm like, I don't think we really are able to read all five and a half chapters of Acts this morning. What we're going to do is we're going to go across and skim across the top so we have context for understanding what Paul is doing and being able to give a defense for the hope that is in him. Because that has a whole, a whole lot of application for those of us who also have experienced the transforming power of Jesus Christ. If you've never experienced that before and you don't know Christ, then this is, this is good. I'm glad you're here because you're going to get a a taste of what the gospel is. You're going to see how great God is and, and how merciful he is and, and how loving he is. We're also going to see this morning out of this passage that God is the one who carries us through deserts and through trials. And the things when we, when we don't know what's going on and we don't understand why God has stuck us in a desert for a period of time and God seems silent, but God speaks and God still moves. We see that all out of this passage if you remember, right, last few weeks, we've been moving with Paul. He's on his third and final missionary journey. He's been traveling around, making Christ known and establishing the churches and going and re revisiting those churches and, and making Christ known, establishing disciples and discipling those who've known Christ. And so he's been doing that for uh, the last couple of years and as he's been traveling around and he's been absolutely clear on the fact that God's called him to go to Jerusalem. To go into Jerusalem, and that, that is a, it's a scary thing because he knows, he knows that uh, when he gets to Jerusalem, there's going to be a whole lot of trials and a whole lot of suffering that's going to come. But he's known that's what God calls him to. So, well, where we pick up in the story in Acts chapter 21, I encourage you to turn your Bibles. If you haven't turned there already, you're going to want to turn and follow along and with me. Uh, we're looking at Acts 21. Verses 27 is where we're going to start, and then we're going to move through chapters 26. We'll skim across there. We'll give context. But he is in Jerusalem, and things are not going well, as we knew. Before we unpack that, why don't we pray and ask God to guide us? Lord, as we turn in our Bibles to uh, this section in Acts Lord, by your spirit, may you speak. Help us to um, strengthen our, our resolve to make you known. Help us to care and to love those around us and those who don't know Christ. And Lord, help us to love. Help us to have your eyes and your heart. Lord, help me to communicate. Lord, help us to be able to understand what your spirit is saying to us so that we will leave here with, with a greater and deeper love for you and, Lord, able to tell others of the great news of your son, Jesus Christ. So we ask this and we pray that you'll guide us in Jesus' name name we pray. Amen. I realize that as we're going to be talking about uh, making Christ known, sharing our faith with others, that there's a number, I, I don't know exactly where you are, but I imagine in a uh, congregation of our size, there's a whole broad breadth of, of what, that, what that stirs up for you. For some of you, you're like, man, I do that all the time. That's easy. Others of you are like, I, I, I don't know. Every time I go to share about Jesus, I get all tongue-tied. Nothing comes out right. And for others, you don't know what to do. You don't know how to do that. And, and so there's a whole broad, broad 
brush stroke of, of emotions and thoughts that I recognize when you start thinking about how do I tell about, and I also know there's a whole cultural thing going on in, in our nation. Uh, there's a change in our culture that we keep everything to yourself. It's personal. Your faith is personal. That's wonderful. Glad you have a faith. Keep it to yourself, right? So I don't want to come across as offensive, and I don't want to, I, I, I don't want others to not like me. I don't want others to think wrongly of me. And so we keep it to ourselves, and hopefully they'll just see that I have such a great life that they'll ask me about it so I can tell them about that. Well, how do we do that? What, what does it all look like? Well, I think we'll see that somewhat here in Acts chapter 21 and following. Paul is in Jerusalem, like I said. Paul has uh, just been in the temple. Uh, he is fulfilling a vow, and uh, he's purified himself, and he's also telling about the fact that, that God has been reaching not just Jews, but also Gentiles. That doesn't go over well with Jews. Uh, the Jewish people here didn't want that, they, uh, and, and they're, they're quite upset. So there's a kind of a riot that begins to get started and stirred up in here, and Paul is rescued and arrested by the Roman guards because of all of the that is coming up here. He's arrested and brought in before the, the Roman tribunal, and he has to make a defense for, well, why is everybody so upset at you, Paul? On his way of being dragged away from a riot that is about ready to ensure across uh, the Jewish community there at the, the, the synagogue. Well, as they come in and they rescue him, they're dragging the, the Romans, gather around Paul. They're dragging him and protecting him from being mercilessly beaten. And as they're coming up the steps, Paul says, hey, real quickly, can I say a word or two to, to the crowd? And they're like, uh, sure, go for it. And, and so, he turns to the crowd and then he speaks and, and here in chapters 22 verses 1 through 21 is Paul's first testimony, first sharing of the gospel and his focus is on Jesus and the transforming power, the transforming work of the Spirit of God. Verse 1 he says in chapter 22, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. He's going to make a defense of what God has done. This is why he's going to be telling this story. And so in verses 1 through 5, Paul's life before Christ. Paul is going to share with the Jewish people that are gathered around who are quite angry at him. This is what my life was like before Christ. Verse 3, I, I am a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. He's like, I recognize you're all zealous for God. You, you love God. You want to go after God. I was the same way. I, I was born just like you. And in verse 4, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. He received letters from the brothers, and, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take these uh, who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. He's like, man, before Christ, I was so zealous for God that, that this was a different way, and they were going against the ways that we had learned in the Old Testament. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to arrest these, these Christians, and I'm going to bring them to prison, and we're gonna be, they're going to be punished. Right? Do you remember Paul is the very one who was leading the charge of the first martyr of Stephen to be stoned to death? It was Paul who led that, also known as Saul at the time. This is his life before Christ. And in verses 6 through 16, you have Paul's encounter with Christ. Verse 6, that I was on my way and I drew near Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, 
I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And then he goes to unfold his encounter with Jesus. There's a point in a time when Jesus encounters Christ. There's before Christ, then he meets Christ. And then in verses 17 through 21 is his life since knowing Christ. You see, when we meet Christ, there's a change that goes on, and this is what Paul's explaining. He returns to Jerusalem, verse 17. He was praying in a temple, and he fell into a trance, and then he was called of God. Verse 21, he said to me, go, and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. He's been transformed by Jesus. Anybody who's been transformed by Jesus has a different story. You're a new creation in Christ. And everything's changed, and for Paul, this is certainly the case, and we've been studying that, right? We're seeing that the church has been alive. The, the, the church becomes alive because the Spirit of God changes lives. So when we meet with Jesus, we meet him, our lives are transformed, and this is what happened with Paul. So we have before Christ, we have his encounter with Christ, and then what's happened since Christ? Well, in Paul's defense of the gospel... Verse 21, that he goes to Jerusalem, or that he goes to the Gentiles. That doesn't go over well. The crowd goes berserk. Verse 23, and they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. They're they are spitting mad. Uh, things are going from bad to worse. And at this point, um, Paul is now brought in by the Roman tribune, the, the guards who are going to go and protect him and figure out why in the world are they so upset at you? Well, you must be, you must be a, a rogue guy and understandably they're going to take you out. What's going on? By the way, if you're not sure about how to share the gospel and where to go and what to talk about, here's one of the things you can't go wrong with. You want to share your story. Talk about what Jesus has done in your life. Point to Jesus. Go to Christ. Go to the resurrection. We're going to see over and over again in his testimony, he goes to the resurrection. He goes to Jesus. Jesus is the turning point. Jesus is the point of all of those things that makes all the difference in the world. It's not good works. It's not keeping the law. It's not all the different things. It is Jesus. It's Jesus that makes all the difference in the world. Well, and Verses uh, 30, chapter 22, verses 30 through chapters 23, verse 11. Paul is going to be making a address before the, the council, before the Pharisees and the Sanhedrins. The, these are the mucky mucks. These are the ones that are high up in the, in the religious uh, order. As a matter of fact, where Paul is going to be making an address, catch this, this is interesting, Paul is going to be making a stance and a defense for the gospel in the same exact place where Stephen was a few decades before when Paul was on the other side when he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, the leader of the Pharisees, and he was giving account and he was giving a judgment against Stephen, the one I mentioned earlier. Paul is now standing in that same place to make a defense for the gospel. Wow, that's transformation. That's a turnaround. Well, Paul is going to be giving an address to them before this council. And it's the hope that the Roman tribunal is going to better understand why they're so upset at Paul through this. Well, Paul brings up this whole thing in his testimony of the resurrection. Well, the resurrection, again, it doesn't go over so well. By the way, you can talk about God a whole lot with people and they don't get all bent out of shape, bring up Jesus. Mm, that's the turning point. Well, Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except by me. Oh, well, that's a little bit narrow. I don't know, just what Jesus said. Um, it is. Just before we're led into Paul's next defense of the gospel. Um, so Paul makes his defense before the Pharisees, Sadducees. Things don't go well. Uh, brings up the resurrection, talks about Jesus. Things go south. They get upset again. They want to tear him from limb to limb. So the 
Romans come in and they rescue him once again and they take him away. They figure there must be something wrong. We're, let's, let's figure out what's wrong with him. So we are going to uh, go ahead and whip him. And that will surely figure out what's wrong. Paul is, uh, he, he's not a superhuman. I, I think that's something I was, as I was reading through, I was reminded Paul isn't superhuman. We we have a tendency to think of him that way. But he's he's a normal guy. He he has fears, discouragement. He's supposed to be going to Jerusalem. He's not anywhere near Jerusalem. He's supposed to be going to Rome, excuse me. He's been called to go to Jerusalem, and then he knows he's going on to Rome, and nothing's happening. He has fears, he's discouraged, and he needs the Lord. And and I just wanted to point out for you in chapter 23, verse 11, because I I think it's it's important where, where God speaks. Look what it says. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome the Lord came and stood by him. And if, if I can just take a, a second, I don't know where you are at and, and what's going on in your world, but you may be incredibly lonely right now. You may be in an incredibly difficult place. That is strange. Um, is this still on? Did I lose it? It's good? It's coming? Okay. If that happens again, we'll switch to the um, handheld. Uh, That's Satan. Um, If you're discouraged, take courage because God will meet you where you are at. Call upon him and don't stop calling out to him. Don't stop calling out to the Lord. Paul's down, he's discouraged, and I think it's right here and why Jesus meets with him. He needed the Lord. And if you need the Lord, call upon him. He'll meet you. So Paul has been giving testimony. He's been proclaiming Christ. He's making Christ known. It's not been going well at any point. And he's sent down to Caesarea. It's the... uh, it's the Roman administrative city, it's still under the area of Rome, and he is going to be giving testimony before the governor of the region, a man by the name of Felix. And do you have any idea what Paul's going to be doing when he gets to stand before and give a defense before Felix, what he's going to be bringing up? The resurrection, Jesus. His life before Christ, his life meeting Christ, and his life after. And Felix is going to hear it all. His focus, once again, in fact, in chapter 24, verse 21, uh, starting verse 20, he's making a defense before Felix. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them. It is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. He's making a defense for the gospel, and he's saying, I'm standing before you, Felix, to give an account because I've been brought up against charges about the the gospel, and it's about the resurrection that I stand here today. I'm convicted as I'm reading through and I'm studying of Paul's willingness to say the hard things regardless of the outcome. I'm convicted of the fact personally of I want people to to like me, to be happy with me. I want people to be pleased with what John says. Paul here, I don't think he doesn't want that, but he's more concerned about what Jesus thinks. He's more concerned about what God thinks than what 
others think, and he's willing to say the hard thing. Jim Elliott said this, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I want to be on the same side as what God has called me to do. How about you? Paul's making a defense for the gospel, and in verse 22 through 27, Paul's kept in in jail, in prison, for saying the, the hard things. He says the hard things to Felix. He gives a testimony. He tells that, Felix, you need to turn. Felix, it's about Jesus. Felix, it's about the resurrection. And he's going to give a defense and look at verse 25. 24, 25. And he reasoned about, look what he talks to about with Felix and Felix's wife, Drusilla. And he reasoned about righteousness and self-control, and the coming judgment. Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you again. Paul is going and talking about righteousness, self-control, and coming judgment. How well do you think that goes? Not well. In fact, do you know how long Paul is now going to be put into prison He's supposed to be going to Rome. He goes into jail to prison for two years. And, and, and over those two years, I think there's maybe another, one other instance where he has the opportunity to make a defense for the gospel. The risk that Paul took to speak the truth to them. I love it. It's hard. Hugh Latimer Hugh Latimer is an English reformer. Uh, English reformer often would preach before King Henry VIII. And on one particular instance, he offended the king with his message and with his boldness. So he was commanded by the king to preach the following weekend and make an apology. So on the next Sunday... Hugh Latimer, the English reformer, comes before the king and reads the text of what she's going to preach from, and he addresses himself before he begins to preach. This is what Hugh Latimer says before the king and everybody around him. This is what he says. Hugh Latimer, dost thou know before whom thou art this day to speak? To the high and mighty monarch the king's most excellent majesty, who can take away thy life if thou offendest. Therefore, take heed that thou speakest not a word that may displease. But then consider well, Hugh, dost thou thou not know from whence thou come, upon whose message thou art sent, even by the great and mighty God, who is all-present, and who beholdeth all thy ways, and is able to cast thy soul in hell. Therefore take heed, take care that thou deliverest thy message faithfully. And then Hugh Latimer gives the same sermon that he preached the week before to King Henry VIII but with more boldness and energy. I love that. That's the kind of boldness that Paul has. That's the kind of boldness that that comes from the Spirit of God to speak when so moved. And in chapters 25, 1 through 12, Paul goes before a governor, a new governor. Felix has been replaced And now there is a new governor while Paul has been sitting in prison, Portius Festus. Keep in mind, years have passed. Nothing is happening. Nothing has changed. Nothing is going well. We know from chapter 24 that there's been this long delay 
Paul's been waiting. That Paul's been falsely accused by the, the Jews of false crimes. He's been exploited in chapters 25, verses 9 through 12. There's a whole lot of unknowns from chapters 25, verses 13 through 22. A whole lot of unknowns. I would say Paul's in the desert. Nothing's changed. Nothing's happened. Paul's in prison. What good is he there? I mean, there's a whole lot of good. He doesn't necessarily know that. It's there that he writes a whole lot of letters to the churches that we have today. But I don't know if Paul knew that exactly. He's in the desert. He's in a hard place. And I know we're, we're talking about the gospel and making Christ known, but I couldn't help but think of the fact that God will often bring us through trials as well. We go through hard places that are meant to draw us to him, that are, that are meant to have us to fall upon him and, and, and grow us in him. And God initiates those trials sometimes. And in the midst of the trials, we have a, we have a, a part to play in the, in the process of transformation. That when you're going through a trial and you're going through a desert, you can resist his trials and you can fight against the circumstances. You can also uh, give out and, and fall into destructive rebelling. Or you can call out to the Lord and you can trust him in the trial. And I think we see over and over again Paul falling upon the Lord. And overall, I see this perseverance of the saint, of, of Paul. We see him persevering. It's like Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, that says this. Listen, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's perseverance. Paul has perseverance. It's easy enough for us to read through here, I think, and to, to get a sense of like, wow, that is... Uh, Nice narrative, nice story, and we just move along and we forget that there's nothing going on in his life. Two years. Where's God? Why isn't God moving? God, I thought you were calling me to Rome. I got here to Jerusalem. I've been obedient. I'm supposed to go to Rome. What's going on? And I sit here in prison. Well, finally, we come to the final defense of Paul's, and it's, here in chapters 25, verses 13 through 26. Paul is going to come before King Agrippa II. King Agrippa and, um, well, I almost called her his wife. She's not his wife. Bernice is her name. This is big thing going on, that Paul is going to make a defense before a king. The governor is still here, and now this king of this region is here, King Agrippa II. Just so you know, he's not exactly a safe character. He doesn't come from, Agrippa doesn't come from this great long line of great character, people of great character. King Agrippa II, who Paul's going to make a defense for, is the great-grandson of Herod the Great, the same one who murdered all babies two years and younger all around Bethlehem when Jesus was born. His great-grandfather was King Herod. His, his grand-uncle of King Agrippa II murdered John the Baptist. And his father, King Agrippa I, executed James and imprisoned Peter. Of course, he also had his guts eaten out by worms because 
God punished him for taking the worship as being a God, but that's another story. But, but here's two people that Paul's going to make a defense for, and also all that are around in this council. Two people that look married but aren't. In fact, Bernice, of, so King Agrippa II, who Paul's going to make a defense for, Bernice is his sister. Uh, one year removed, uh, this incestuous, sinful relationship that, that they are in, Paul is going to make a defense of the gospel before them. I don't know, what would you say if you had the opportunity to make Christ known to somebody as high as that? Well, here is the most detailed defense of the gospel in verses chapter 26, verses 4 through 11. Once again, Paul shares his life before Christ. In verse 6, look at 26, verse 6. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God. He stands here on trial to talk about the hope that is in him. And he talks about his life before Christ. Verses 12 through 18, his encounter with Christ. He stands there and makes a defense to talk about when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. Where did Jesus meet you? Where did God rescue you? Where did he pluck you from? Has he met you? Do you know Christ? We have Paul's before Christ, his encounter with Christ. And then in verses 19 through 23, his ministry in Christ. Verse 23, again, he says that Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. He talks about the resurrection. He talks about Christ before this king. And then in verses 24 through 29, as we wrap up here, this final little piece, Paul calls for a decision. Paul calls for, uh, what are you going to do about this? Look at verse 24. And as he was saying these things in his defense for the gospel, Festus, the governor, said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. You're crazy, Paul. You've gone right over the edge. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. So he's, so he's, he's saying, look, this whole thing, this isn't some secret that's gone on. Jesus dying on the cross, shh, it's a secret. Nobody's known about it. We just want to let you in on a little secret. It's not a secret. It hasn't been done in the corner. Everybody knows about it. Verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, catch this. Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am. Well, except ching for these chains. He moves for a decision. I, 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 uh, there's so much to learn from this. When you make Christ known, do, do you know how to explain the gospel? If somebody were to say, I, what, what is a Christian? Like, how do you explain the gospel? You know those four words that I've used in explaining the gospel? Four words that keep in mind when I'm going through and I'm explaining the gospel, and you can jump in at any point. God, man, Christ, response. God, man, Christ, response. God, God is holy and just, and God is a God of love and a God of mercy, but he is holy. And man, he has 
He has fallen short of the glory of God. He has gone his own way. He is in need of salvation. He is in need of rescuing. This week, as uh, we're riding around, I love taking Uber cars and, and getting rides on Uber. So all this week, I've had, uh, for days on end, I was getting these rides on these Uber cars. And for whatever reason, around D.C., there is a whole lot of, of Muslims that are driving around in Uber cars. And it's been this great opportunity because... Well, frankly, we've been in this in our small group. We're going through a Muslim study, and because I've been needing to kind of re-understand what is the, what is the, the Islamic faith, what do they believe, and and how do I engage with Muslims? And one of the things we've been challenged with is, hey, engage with your Muslim friends. I'm like, I don't know any Muslims. Like, I don't know any Muslims. I, I know a bunch of Christians, and I don't know Muslims. So I was super excited when. On my Uber app was Muhammad, who was picking me up. I'm like, awesome, I bet this guy's Muslim. And you know, when we got in the car, I wanted to share Christ, and I prayed beforehand, and you know what came out? Pfft, nothing. It was just flat. Uh, nothing happened. And um, so I, there was four or five opportunities we had uh, between Muhammad's and Ali's and numerous people that we had and I was able to find out, like, oh, so how long have you been here? And uh, so, oh, you're from a certain Middle Eastern country. I said, oh, are, are you Muslim? I said, yes, I am. I said, oh, wow, that's super interesting. So, and, and I looked for opportunities, and I prayed. Sometimes, whoop, fell flat. Other times, opportunities to be able to make Christ known. But I found that um, I needed to pray. I needed to be willing to let God move and stir. But one of the things I was thinking about was God, man, Christ, response. What do they think about God? They use the word Allah. Well, Allah is God, but I know there's a huge distinction between a Muslim God and, and the Christian God. The God of the Bible is different. But we talked about God. Sometimes we would talk about man. And one of the things I'd ask is, well, do you know you're going? So like, how do you get to heaven? In, in your faith, help me understand, how do you get to heaven? He's like, well, I'm not positive. You can. I said, ah, oh, well, how do you know that? He's like, well, you want to be a really good Muslim. I said, well, if, how do you know if you're a really good Muslim, you're going to make it or not? He said, well, we don't know. That's why we, we do what we do and we, we pray depends on if you're a, uh, a Sunni or a Shiite and, and how many times you pray a day or how you pray or if you do Ramadan. And hey, his Ramadan, as you've been following that for 30 days, you go through Ramadan, you fast and you have to be, deny yourself of all pleasures as long as there's daylight during Ramadan and then during night, then you can eat, you can drink, you can enjoy pleasures. But during the day, you can't because you're praying specifically for God to move on a specific instance. And I'd say, so has God answered you during your time of Ramadan? One of them said, yes. And I thought, oh, well, that's a dead end. And other times, uh, we find out, so, so if you can't be guaranteed, I said, as a Christian, I, I know that I'm bound for hell if it wasn't for Jesus. There's no way that I can be good enough. I can't be good enough. I already know. So it, it eliminated the doubt for me as a Christian whether I'm going to heaven or hell. I'm, I'm going to hell, and the only reason why I'm going to heaven, and I have certainty of that, is because of what Jesus did on the cross. I didn't go anywhere either, but God, man, Christ, response. Paul here drives for response. Do you know the gospel? Do, do you know how to tell others about Jesus to make Christ known? We see here over and over again throughout our passages that we've been looking at this morning, Paul shares his life before Christ. He shares his life as he is rescued by Christ. And he shares his life, what's happened since Christ and the great news of the resurrection. It's a great place to go because Jesus isn't dead, he's alive. In other religions, maybe they follow Jesus as a prophet, but Jesus has come and gone. I said, well, what do you do 
with one of our drivers, well, what do you do with the Bible when he says that Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life? Well, we don't believe that part. Oh, well, that's the part that changes everything for me. Jesus isn't dead, he's alive. Do you, do you, here, here's what I was wrestling with in this, this whole passage and, and wanting to apply what Paul is saying for, for me and for us as a church. I think that when we have been transformed by the Spirit of God and we continue to grow in Christ, we have something to share. If, if you've not been transformed by Jesus and, and you're not growing in Christ and your life is just flatlined, God is just an addition to your life, there's not a whole lot to share and there's not a whole lot of joy and there's not a whole lot of reason to be able to tell others about Jesus. But when you have been transformed, when you're growing in him, when you, when you realize that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, when you realize that what Jesus has done, you have a whole lot of reason for the hope that is in you. Because it's not in you, it's because of what Jesus has done and you need Christ. Just as every single person that you've never looked into the eyes of another person who's not loved by God, it doesn't need Jesus. They need Christ. And, and until we have been impacted by Christ, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of sharing. I do think there's a place, and there's a place for, for us as a church as a reminder of the fact that there's a whole lot of lost around us that don't know Christ, and we need to be reminded of that. Unfortunately, I need to be reminded of that. But if they don't know Christ, there's an eternity in hell. All the Muslim friends that I was meeting, there's an eternity in hell. They don't know if they're going to be good enough. They're not. It's because of Jesus. Jesus is the turning point. And that's the same way with my neighbors around me. All the neighbors around you, the people you work with. If they don't know Christ, there's an eternity apart from God. And I want others to know Jesus, to be transformed by him. I want you to be transformed by him. Until you've been transformed and changed by the Spirit of God, I don't think there'll be a whole lot of sharing going on. And I'm reminded here in Acts that not everybody, in fact, most everybody will reject the message. You know, there weren't, the, the, there's, there's no account here of, of a revival that takes place in, in Jerusalem or in Caesarea. All of a sudden, everybody starts turning to Christ. No. They hated him. They hated Paul. They will hate you. And I don't like that. I don't like it when people hate me. But I want to be a Hugh Latimer. I, I want to be a Paul. I, I want to be one who's transformed, that's willing to love people enough to make Christ known when, when God gives me the opportunity. And I pray for that. Pray for opportunities. You parents, pray for opportunities to share with your kids. You, who, where, where you go to work tomorrow, pray for opportunities. When you get in your next Uber ride, pray for opportunities. And overcome your fear of rejection by listening to the Spirit of God and when he so speaks, open your mouth. The more you share, the easier it gets, by the way. But tell of his great work in your life. And finally, church, live it out. Live it out. Why don't we pray? Um, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I don't know where this strikes you. 
What I do know is that every one of us need Jesus. And we've been given the Great Commission. We've been given a call to make him known. And I want to live that out. But it starts right here in the heart. So my prayer for you, church, is that, uh, that God will be doing a work in your heart. And, and if you need comforting, you need, uh, you need him, that uh, you will, um, he'll meet you this morning. He'll comfort you. To come alongside you. For others of us that that uh, that we would be in fuego and on fire for the Spirit of God to move and to lead us and drive us to Him. God, would you have your way? Lord, would you would you uh, meet us here? Lord, every heart, that every heart would turn to you. That every heart would be open to what your spirit is saying. God, have your way. God, I ask and I beg and plead that you will not be silent. May we be a people that are transformed by your transforming power. Transformed by you. Filled by you.